very, very good afternoon, afternoon to one and all present here. here. Welcome, Welcome to the fourth session of the live lecture series organized as part of Human Space Flight Center, sorry, Human Space Flight Expo 2022. From the start of space activity, scientists recognized that spacecrafts could gather scientifically valuable data about the various planets, moons, and smaller, smaller bodies in the solar system and beyond. This would mean being able to study their environments remotely and, and quite possibly being able to search for new life. Today's session gives a detailed insight on this interplanetary space exploration and all of its challenges. Dr. Shri Kumar is an astrophysicist by training and is currently the Satish Dhawan Professor at ISRO HQ. After his MSc in Physics from IIT Bombay, he, he pursued his PhD research on gamma ray astronomy at the University of New, New Hampshire, USA. His postdoctoral research focused on the emerging area of observing the universe in gamma rays using NASA's Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. After a decade at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, he joined ISRO in 1999 to head the Space Astronomy Division. In, in 2013, 2013, he went on deputation from ISRO as director of Indian Institute of Astrophysics. In 2018, he returned to ISRO HQ as the director of the Space Science Program Office until his superannuation as Distinguished Scientist in 2020. Dr. Shri Kumar is the co-PI of India's first dedicated astronomy observatory, AstroSat. He, he was the principal, principal investigator, investigator of payloads on lunar, lunar missions and, and currently participates as a member and chair of many review committees linked to space science missions of ISRO. Dr. Shri Kumar's primary research interest varied over the years from the study of gamma rays to X-rays from cosmic sources, solar coronal emission to chemistry of the lunar surface. As an experimentalist, his most recent involvement was in the design and development of X-ray mirrors for future space use. I take immense pleasure in welcoming our speaker, Dr. P. Shri Kumar, to the stage. Welcome, sir. I request Meena to present a sampling to Dr. Shri Kumar. Thank you, Meena. Before, Before we begin, the audience may note that there will be an interactive Q&A session after the lecture. Students, you may note down your questions during the lecture and ask them at the end of the, stage, uh, at the, end of the session. I now hand over the stage to our speaker to begin with the session. Can you hear me? There are, there are some, some seats up front, front so those of you who want to come and sit here, please do. Uh, thank, thank you, Shweta, for the generous introduction. Uh, so I've been asked to talk to you about uh, interplanetary exploration and its challenges. Okay. Can you all hear me? Oh, fine. Uh, so, so let's... Uh, Let's, Let's begin by going, going to the earliest part of the universe. No. No. How, How old is this universe? Does anybody know? There, there you go. 13.4 billion. Now, billion, billion is a very large number, number right? right? It's, it's very, very hard, hard to think of billion. billion. All, All right. right. In, In this 13.4 13 billion, billion years ago, something, something happened. happened. What, what was that? Big Bang. Big Bang. Now, did, did anybody hear the Big Bang? bang? No. 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 Good. Good. Uh, so, so we, we think, think something, something like the Big Bang, Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. 
and, and then, then some, and the universe was formed, and we'll, we'll get, get to that in a minute. And the universe formed, but before the belief is that when the universe began, it had mostly what element in the periodic table? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Mostly hydrogen. Okay. And then maybe a little bit of helium, because that was, we believe, was there in the early universe. But, but what you see is, uh, is that a pointer? Is there a pointer for this? Middle, Middle one, one, right? Oh, oh that's the point. Oh, oh, I see. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. okay. So, so uh, all right, it doesn't matter. matter. But, but we, we now know that, uh, for, for example, the Earth's crust is made up of not just hydrogen and helium, but many, many elements, elements, right? And, and in, in the, the chemistry class, we talk about the elements, elements of the periodic table. table. So, so in, the in the early days of uh, modern science, science, there was this question about how did uh, these elements form from... Uh, I can't get this right, I think. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. okay, there you go. Uh, how, how, how did it form from hydrogen to helium? helium? And, and, and there was uh, this, this gentleman here in the middle, uh, uh, sorry, at the end. This is Fred Hoyle, a UK, UK astronomer and a physicist, who had uh, very, very early thoughts that uh, that, that all, all elements we are, were, were not formed during the Big Bang, Bang and something else must have happened. happened. And, and that, that's, that's where they started asking, asking the question of how, how did stars get involved in this issue? issue. So, so in, in, the, in 1948 or so, these, these four, uh, sorry, these these four, four uh, scientists, scientists here, here this, this is, is a couple, couple Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage. And, and the middle, middle is, uh, this is Fred Hoyle, sorry, William Fowler, and this is Fred Hoyle. And, and their initials as B, B, F, H. So, so the theory is often called as B squared F, H, under which they actually formulated a model that said, you can, you can actually synthesize heavy elements from hydrogen and helium, helium through, through a series of processes which they actually validated, part, part of it at least in the laboratory through calculations and some experimentation. So, so today we understand that much, much of the elements in the universe came from stars through processes of nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear processes. And, uh, and, and one, one of the ways in which you look at elements beyond Earth to know, know what, what is the composition of something beyond Earth is to look at things like meteorites. So this is an example of a meteorite you know, that fell in Jaipur in 2017. And, and we study the composition of meteorites. You can actually see what is in it, what are the elements in it, what are the, you know. So there are minerals identified here, for example, olivine. Olivine is something that you also see on the moon. A very, very important, important element, element that we try like to understand. So, so this, this is how we've been trying, trying to understand the overall composition of the universe. And then the, the slight, slight change is not happening. Can, Can somebody, somebody just click it? Ah, oh, got No, no it's gone one step, step further. Can you just go one step, step back? back? No. no. Going, going the wrong way. way. Can, Can you go, go back? back? All right. Okay. So, so I begin, begin with the, the, the nearest star, star that we have, which is our sun. And the, the sun, when it formed, you know, and when, when did the sun and the solar system, system form? Does anybody know? Very, Very good. good. I mean, everybody, everybody knows all the answers. answers. I, think I think I should ask questions and you would answer. Uh, so so 4.5 or 4.6 billion years ago, what, what happened was a lot of gas in what we now think of as our solar system collapsed under gravity. Gravity is a force, force that, that exists, exists all over the universe, universe with, with infinite, infinite distance. And, and then under this gravity, gravity not only did it bring the gas together, together but it also brought in some magnetic field. field. Now, the question, question of where this original magnetic field came from, we do not really know. know. But magnetic fields and gas tend, tend to stick together under a certain uh, theory. We don't have time to discuss it. And, and when, so when the gas collapsed to form the star, the field, the field also went, went along with it. So if you were to think that initially, the, the magnetic field was looped in, in this fashion uh, into the star, where it actually, actually forms like a dipole, dipole, dipole of field. And, and because the sun is not a solid body, the sun is rather a body where the equator rotates faster than the poles. So what happens is the magnetic field in the equator gets pulled uh, at, at, a, at, a at a different rate, rate compared to the pole, and, and it is the least twisting of the magnetic fields. So, so when the field gets twisted over a long period of time, it actually stores energy, 
And at some point, that energy in the magnetic field becomes very large, and then that has to be released. And that release is what we often think of as a solar event, like a solar flare, where it releases energy stored in the magnetic fields into particles, and that particles stream into the inner solar system. Uh, and this cycle typically has a period of roughly, does anybody know how long is a solar cycle? 11 years. Every 11 years, the, 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 the cycle, the sun goes through a pattern, pattern where the, the number, number of sunspots, sun you've all seen sunspots sun on the sun, and the, the number, number of sunspots sun increase and decrease. So every 11 years you actually see this, and part of the reason this 11 year cycle is because of this rotation period where the, the magnetic, magnetic field configuration goes from one type to another type. Okay. So let's, let's go beyond that. that. Now this is a, a picture of an eclipse. eclipse. How, many How many have you seen a solar eclipse? eclipse? Very, very good. good. No, no, very, very good. good. So it's, it's one, one of the most beautiful phenomena that you can actually visualize, visualize isn't it? Though, Though it's, it's there for a very short time. time. And, and what, what do you see in the solar eclipse? You actually, see what, is, what, is what is particularly nice about, nice about solar eclipses is the sun's, sun's disk, which, which is now blocked in this case, is about, about a million times brighter than the surrounding. I mean, when you have such a large contrast, you can never see the outer region, which we call as a corona. So if you want to see the corona, you've got to block it. And, and that, that is exactly, exactly what we do with this upcoming Aditya mission. In the earlier video, there was a discussion about uh, uh, an ISRO mission called Aditya L1, which actually attempts to create artificially a solar, solar eclipse in the, in the spacecraft so that, so that we can study the corona of the sun. Now, what, what is interesting about the corona of the sun is, is the, the fact that it is extremely hot. The, the surface of the sun, the, the surface, surface that we see, is roughly, any idea how hot is it? But 6,000 degrees. 6,000 degrees, oh, 6, degrees uh, is not a very high temperature, because on in the inside of the sun is where the nuclear fusions are happening. Hydrogen is getting combined to form helium, and that is what is generating this enormous energy that we get to from the sun. So when the center of the sun is, is actually where the power source is, and when it comes to the surface, it's already 6,000 degrees Kelvin, how is it possible that the corona outside is 2 million degrees Kelvin? See, See this. You know, it's, you know, it's like, like you know, you, you put something, something on a stove, and, and the, the, the source, source of heat is there, but, but as, as you go further away, near, near the corona, the temperature seems to move, be larger, larger than the temperature at the surface of the sun. So, so this question is often, often termed as, what heats the corona? It is an outstanding puzzle, and one, one of the objectives of our Aditya mission is to look for that uh, reasons under which this actually happens. And today, and today we have some general ideas of what makes this uh, corona hot, and that's, that's largely similar to what I described earlier, where energy stored in the magnetic fields of the sun is released into particles, which actually then heats the corona. But, but that is something that we will get, get to know after our Aditya mission. So, so when, when this uh, magnetic field gets, energy in the magnetic field becomes very large, it, it is then rearranged and released in the form of energy for particles. That, that produces when these particles, particles like electrons, electrons are severely, are extremely energized, and they, they strike a target, they, they release x-rays. The, the typical x-ray machine that you in your dentist office or in the, in the hospital, we, we do exactly the same thing. We actually accelerate electrons, make it hit a target, and, and from the target, x-rays are produced, and you use it. So similarly, on the sun, the, the particles that are accelerated, accelerated by the release, release of energy from the twisted magnetic fields hits, hits the surface of the sun and, and releases x-rays. And, rays. and these are, uh, what, what you see here is a plot of, of time along the x-axis, and along the y-axis we plot the brightness of x-rays. How, how intense is x-rays? And what you see is this x-ray emission is not steady, it keeps going up and down, and these are called solar flares. Now, solar flares are are classified as various spots in, 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 in these letters, letters A, B, C, M, and X. Each one is 10 times stronger than the other. So very, so very recently, you can you, you we anticipate the strongest uh, flares, flares are expected to be X class, and there are X10, X20, all these classifications there. But the idea is this is a very intense uh, processes where a lot of energy is actually dumped into the uh, uh, particles, which then result in very strong and bright X-rays, and, and these X-rays hit, hit Earth and, and its atmosphere. And it has a direct implication both for those of us living on Earth as well as our colleagues who are going to be will we'll be, be up in space, space and some of you many years from now may be up in space. space. So, so you need, need to worry about sun and its solar, solar events, sun and flares. 
But often, it is not just the X-rays that come, because X-rays come very quickly. How long, How long does it take for the light to come from the sun to earth? Eight, eight, eight minutes. Very good. But, but why? why? Because these are particles with no mass, mass right? Photons, Photons have, have no mass. mass. But, but particles, particles also come. come. Sun also is blowing something called the solar, solar wind. wind. Electrons and protons and alpha particles, alpha particles are all coming out of the sun, sun carrying with it some, some magnetic field also. also. So, so this bath of fields and particles is what we call a solar, solar wind. wind. It flows at a rate of about a few hundred kilometers per second, coming towards us, and that's of concern. Now, now that, that, that uh, uh, flow of plasma will take, take some time because it can't travel at the speed of light. It travels, travels maybe at you know, one-fifth one or one-tenth the speed of light. Because, because it has, it's, it's a made of particles with masses, masses. Not, not zero, zero mass, but mass masses. So, so Einstein's, Einstein's theory tells you that they, they cannot travel at the speed of light. light. So, so typically after a flare, which, which comes in eight minutes on Earth, particles, particles come half, half a day later, sometimes two days later. So And we need to know when they come because these are also of great concern to both, both astronauts, astronauts as well as for systems on Earth. And uh, this, this is monitored, monitored by a series of satellites called GOES that the Americans have put together. But, but we also have satellites in our, say for example, this is an experiment on our Chandrayaan-2 mission, orbiter mission, that is, that is looking at the sun all the time. And it actually sees very, very strong uh, X-ray emission. Sometimes, Sometimes it, it is bright, bright. It, it is more sensitive than the the, the other, other experiment that is currently on. So many, many people, people around the world are monitoring these things because this is important to monitor. And this monitoring is sometimes called space weather, weather monitoring. Just, just as we have weather on Earth, Earth there, there is weather, weather in space. space. That, that is called space weather. weather. We, we talk about the presence or absence of particles and fields. Now, now let's, let's come, come to Earth now. now. Earth also has a magnetic field because why? Earth, Earth also forms the same ball of gas, gas from where the sun was formed. What was, what was left over is where the, 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 the planets, planets of the solar system came. came. And, and when Earth, Earth formed, it also absorbed, uh, carried, carried some of the magnetic field that was there in the original nebula. nebula. And, and so, so today, Earth, Earth has a magnetic field that is dipolar in nature. It's, it's like as though there's a bar magnet and fields are very similar to it. You identify the north and the south pole. And the Earth also spins. Right. So, so that's, that's an important, important issue, and, and we believe this field is also generated by not just the original primordial field, but also liquid core, liquid maybe iron and nickel, which actually uh, rotates inside the core of the Earth, which is then acting as a source of generating magnetic fields. So, so this magnetic field is not necessarily steady. I mean, we don't have time to discuss it, but there are times when this magnetic field changes, it can flip. North, north can become south, south, south can become north, etc. But that happens over very long periods of time. Now, now, so, so you now have this solar, solar wind coming in, hitting, hitting Earth, and Earth, Earth has a magnetic field. field. So, so what it does is it actually uh, sweeps, sweeps it in a manner where the Earth's field is actually, is actually blown, blown into, into a long bubble. bubble. And, and this is, but, but it, it also protects us from a lot of the solar particles because, because the solar particles are shielded by the Earth's magnetic field. And, 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 and but, but then some of them penetrate the poles of the Earth, the North and the South Pole. And when they penetrate the Earth, these, these particles, particles excite nitrogen, nitrogen and oxygen um, molecules in our atmosphere. And, and when they, when they, when they excite molecules, they excite, they release, release light, light in the form of, of these, these colors. colors. This, this is the uh, northern lights, lights often called the aurora, which is actually is an indication of charged, charged particles interacting with our atmosphere. atmosphere. When, when the, the sun is very active, you expect, expect more, more of this stuff. stuff. And, and that's, that's why, why typically during very, very active phases, phases the, the number, number of aurorae that you would see, see, even sometimes you know, at equatorial latitudes, you know, you've seen, seen them at very low latitudes, latitudes it arises because of this uh, intense uh, flux, flux of flow of charged, of charged particles into the Earth's magnetic field. field. Now, now, this, this picture was also shown in the uh, uh, video that was shown a little while ago. It's a very important picture because this has the person in the middle is uh, someone, someone named John, John James Van, Van, Van Allen. Now, now as, as was mentioned in the video, uh, immediately after the Sputnik, the Americans had this Explorer program. This was Explorer 1, and they, they were involved in it. In it. This is Von Braun, the famous, famous uh, German, German rocket, rocket designer. And uh, Pickering was, was the first uh, uh, early director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So they, they were very successful, very happy with this initial Explorer 1 mission. Explorer 2, uh, James Van Allen, 
had designed, designed a, an, an experiment to look for particles, to look for the presence of electrons and protons in space. space. At, that At that time, remember, we do not know anything about this stuff. And when they when an explorer two went up, they, they found there was a very intense uh, detection of particles in space, in space and uh, people, people really thought that space is radioactive. And there, and there was serious, serious concerns about what is it to really get into space, we don't really know. Uh, but, but today, today we understand, understand that, arising from the fact that particles, particles come from the sun largely are trapped, trapped because of the, our magnetic field being a dipolar field, actually can trap particles for long periods of time into little, uh, uh, little uh, bubble-like structures, which we call as belts. These are the Van Allen belts. They're named after Van Allen. And, and these belts, belts which are shown in these colors, colors are actually places, places where particles are uh, uh, intensely trapped. trapped. And, uh, and, and it's clearly something, something of concern if, you, if, if humans want to cut through that to get to, say, moon and other places. places. I'll, I'll give you, show you a zoom version of that. Of that. So, so here is the same thing. thing. And, and this is Earth. And uh, uh, this, this little point here, which is very hard to do with this pointer, is where the International Space Station is. So you can see. That's, That's roughly about 400 kilometers of our Earth. So, so 400 kilometers means we are well inside the radiation, trapped radiation, radiation belts. But, but if you want to go to the moon, moon and well, even before that, that, even you can see that, that you know, a geostationary satellite actually is often cutting through these belts. Very, very large, intense belt of electrons are out there. And, and if you want to go to the moon, you have, you have no choice but to cut through this, this, this belt. And, and when you cut through this belt, you worry about the impact of radiation. On, on equipment, on uh, control systems, on uh, and human beings as well. As well. And, and so, so even when we're designing Chandrayaan-1 and, and Chandrayaan-2 missions, missions where you really trying to get to the moon, one, one of the challenges is to minimize the number of transits through these belts, such that, that you can, the, the radiation damage is minimized. Uh, at the same time, we want to have adequate security with regard to thorough knowledge about orbits, etc. So minimization of number of transits is very critical. Clearly, as, as humans who want to leave Earth and go to elsewhere, this, this is a point of great concern. You need, you need to know, you know how, how you want to minimize the number of such passages. So, so even in the first Apollo missions, the, the, the transit was uh, very, very, very quick because there, there were humans on board. Uh, but, but that, that often means you need more powerful rockets, etc. Uh, these, these belts have, have another problem. problem. They're, They're not steady. steady. They, they don't look the same all the time. time. Go, Go back, back to the story that I mentioned about how sun's particles, solar of wind and solar flare events, can actually populate these belts. So, so when that happens, the belt can grow and the belt can shrink. So you need to be constantly studying the state of this belt if you really want to plan a trip to moon or a trip to Mars. Uh, you have to cut across this. So you can see in this cartoon here how the belt has completely filled. See, during a geomagnetic storm, it's completely filled. And, and so, so many, for many days, it may be like that. So, so then you need to shift your uh, strategy of actually going to that moon, moon or going to that uh, moon or Mars uh, appropriately. There, there is another issue that we... Uh, so, so let's, let's assume I managed manage to get into a near Earth orbit around Earth, and when you, and and we fly many spacecrafts around Earth, and when we, if you have carry a little particle detector on board, what, what we notice is... Uh, uh, as, as we go, go around Earth, Earth there, there is a region just above Brazil where a lot, lot of our uh, hardware has actually gone bad, bad uh, which we are concerned. And we know, but we understand it because it, it, appears, it looks like what, what is happening there is the Earth's field is not a perfect dipole and there is in the center of the magnetic uh, structure of Earth is not, not exactly to the geometric center of Earth. And, and so that offset leads to uh, the region are close, close to Brazil, Brazil being a little closer to the strong fields. And that, and that gives rise to a region where you have much more intense field particles than other places. So whenever spacecraft orbits cut that, we often have to switch off our instruments. You know, you if you have a high voltage instrument, instrument that requires, say, 2,000 volts to uh, operate, as, as you run, run it through, if the experiment is on, you might, might actually have damages to the instrument. Uh, when, when you, you have, have humans on board, you have to really make sure that that, that time, that, that passage is minimized as, as much as possible, and the contour within which you have really to be careful is also monitored regularly, because just, just like the radiation belts, this, this contour also changes with solar, solar activity. activity. So, so that, that is this uh, uh, radiation, the South Atlantic, Atlantic anomaly region that we discuss here.
And finally, there's all the radiations that we discussed. There is one I didn't discuss so far, that is called galactic cosmic rays. Uh, cosmic rays are rays, they're not really rays, they're actually particles, primarily made of protons, alpha particles, but they also contain heavy elements, heavy ions, uh, ionized iron. Um, and uh, they are all over the present, throughout the whole galaxy. Even today, even after nearly 100 uh, plus years, we don't, we don't exactly, exactly know the origin, origin of these cosmic rays, but we have some general ideas. ideas. The idea is largely these are particles that are accelerated to extremely high energies during the death, death of a star. When a star dies, what do you, do you call the death of a star? Supernova. supernova. Good. Good. So, so in supernova, when, when the when this shock wave goes, goes out, it accelerates particles, and, and that is one way in which you can explain the particle spectrum of these cosmic rays. And today. Of, of all the particles that we know of, of as the most energetic particles, particles things, things, you know, the, the, the light in this room with which we are seeing each other, it has an energy of roughly about two electron volts. So, so in those units, units of electron volts, these, these particles have 10 to the 20 electron volts. Now you can imagine that. It's an extremely energetic particle coming in through. We don't, we don't understand how we can accelerate such high particles, high energies, but we detect them. And they're primarily, as I said, protons. Uh, Antiprotons, anti antiparticles were discovered first in galactic cosmic rays. And, and so, in, in our solar system, also, you have this cosmic rays blowing all over the place. place. So, so, astronauts out in space are also subject to exposure from these cosmic rays. rays. And, and because they have heavy ions in them, when, when a heavy ion hits a shield, for example, the, the, the surface of your crew module, while, while some, some of the protons, protons may be stopped, stopped, some of the heavy ions give rise to further products as secondary emission. And, and these these second image can enter, enter the crew module. module. So, so you have to also make sure that the design of the system is such that the heavy, heavy ions do not produce damaging radiation on the inside. And, and finally, as, a, as, a, as, as an element, element of cosmic rays also, there are things, things called neutrons. neutrons. Have you heard of neutrons? Neutrons. Neutrons, neutrons are neutral particles, but, but they're terribly damaging for human biology in particular. Because, you know, our body is largely made up of water. And water has a lot of protons. The, the neutron, neutron mass is very, very close to a proton, proton mass. So, so when, when they, they hit, hit like billiard balls, they just bounce all over the place. In the process, process of bouncing, what happens is we end up doing a lot, lot of damage to tissues. tissues. So, so neutron, neutron damage is quite a concern and quite, and quite serious. serious. And, and neutrons, neutrons are not easy to stop. stop. They're, they're not, not easy to detect, detect. They're, they're not, not easy to stop. stop. So, so that's, that's a challenge for future human space travel as well. So that's how cosmic rays are actually produced. So from the radiation perspective, we need to worry about the sun, and, and it's uh, strange uh, events, events that happen at unpredictable times. times. Even today, we cannot predict when a solar flare will happen. Scientists, scientists are, of course, working towards making predictive models and the cosmic ray environment in which we live in. And uh, so, so this is actually an indication of the cosmic ray spectrum. And actually, this is all the elements in the cosmic rays. We actually see almost all the elements on the periodic table are also there on the cosmic rays. And, uh, but, but there's, there's a, a longer story, story to this, but we don't have time to discuss that. So, so finally, I want to end with one uh, slide that actually discusses something that exploration, human exploration, is uh, multiple reasons. We go because, as uh, on the opening day, the chairman of Israel gave a very nice uh, 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 lecture on why humans explore. But part, part of the reason we also explore is to look for uh, the, the fact, fact that, that uh, are there life, life elsewhere? elsewhere? Are, are we the only planet? planet? Are, are we the only civilization on this planet Earth? Earth? Uh, and, and why, why when this galaxy has a lot of stars? stars? How many stars, stars does this galaxy, galaxy have? Our galaxy. Some, Some 10, 10 billion, billion thousand. thousand. Yeah, yeah, large numbers. numbers. Yeah, 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 very, very large numbers. numbers. So, so, how many? 400 billion. He has counted it. So I believe you on that. Lots, Lots of stars. stars. When, when you have so many stars in this galaxy, galaxy why, why, why the sun? sun? And the sun, sun is an ordinary, ordinary star. star. You, you look, look at the kind of stars, stars that exist in our galaxy, galaxy. it's just, just one, one of the standard ordinary, ordinary stars. Star. In, in this ordinary star, star which has about you know, you know, some, some eight, eight or nine rocks going, going around it, on, on the third rock, today we are sitting here and talking. Why only us? This question is always there. So how do we do it? So way back in 1961, uh, Francis, Francis Drake, Drake, who was at that time uh, working, working on radio astronomy, astronomy said, okay, okay, let, let me just calculate a possibility of life elsewhere in the universe with, with simple calculations. calculations. And, and he said, I just, I just look, look at the number of stars in the galaxy suitable for life, 
that I multiplied with a fraction which has planetary systems. Remember, at that time, we are not, we are not aware of any planetary system other than our own. Okay, 1961. Uh, then, then he said he multiplied that with the average number of planets suitable for life. Not every planet is good for life. We call this habitable planets, places, places where water, liquid water exists. So that is, we believe, is important for life. Then, then you multiply that with the probability that life can start on a planet. Sometimes, you know, even our own Earth, it's not clear, did life begin here or was it planted from elsewhere? The panspermia theory. Then, then you, you multiply, multiply that, that with the, the, that probably the life produces an intelligent life, life because, because you, know, you, you need to communicate, communicate with them. And, 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 and go on. And, and they, they want to communicate. And, and the time of the, that, that only some, some fraction of the time of a star might host or enable, or enable life to exist. To exist. So, so this, this is a sort of a problem calculation that is you've seen probably in many places. And today, with the ability to detect planets, so on the right, what you see is a light curve that shows as, as a function, a function of, time, of time, the brightness of, of a star. And what, what you see is stars dip. dip. You know, you know, the light, light from a star suddenly goes, undergoes, it will decrease, decrease, and it goes, and then it gets back to normal. normal. Today, we believe that is happening whenever a planet of the, uh, that's going, going around the star is actually blocking a little bit of the light from the star. So it's a tiny bit of light, but today we have very sensitive instruments that can measure that thing. And, and what, what you're seeing here, here in the middle, middle is actually a, a, a signal, a data, data that was collected from our, our, our own telescope, telescope in the dark. The, the Indian of Astrophysics operates a telescope they call the Himalayan Chandra, Chandra Telescope. telescope. And, and using that Chandra Telescope, telescope they've actually seen that thing. thing. Of course, uh, there, there have been other telescopes around the world, the world also that detected it. So, and so there's a system called TRAPPIST 1B. It's not very far from us, about 40, 50 light years from here. And, and what, what they, they saw there is, uh, you can actually see uh, uh, presence, presence of planets, and, and they found not just one planet, but many planets. So, so a solar system is not far away from where we are. So, so given the probability of such issues, issues if you were to calculate, calculate this n, I am sure you, you all agree, agree it's, it's not, not equal to zero. If it's not equal to zero, it means there's a very high probability there's life elsewhere in the universe, and then we, of course, need to search for it. So that's, so that's an important, important issue, right? right? So, so this, this is Francis Drake, Drake 61. Nobody, nobody believed him. He's writing, writing on the board. But, but we see. It. Now, now if, if you look at the nearest planets, planets of ours, um, Venus, Venus and Mars, Mars and, uh, and, uh, and Earth, one, one thing we notice is this enhanced this signature for oxygen. oxygen. Now, early, early Earth, Earth did not have a lot of oxygen. oxygen. So, so there there is a, there's another story on that. But, but somewhere, somewhere at, at a, a point, point where life, life multiplied, multiplied in a certain fashion, you believe, believe oxygen and whether oxygen drove, drove it or, or, or that drove the presence of oxygen, oxygen is yet to be addressed. But, but oxygen, oxygen presence in the atmosphere of Earth is visible from outside. outside. So, so one, one of the sure ways to look for potential planets where there is potential life is to search for oxygen. You know, the, the most recent results from the James Webb Telescope one, One of them is actually, uh, they, they have actually detected detectable uh, water signals. signals. And this, this is coming because we are able to see spectral signatures of atmospheric co components of planets when they, they go in front of a star. star. So, so that's, that's a very really emerging, emerging area of research, research and I'm sure a very, very exciting area for future, future days to come. come. I, think I think that's all I have. And I will stop here so, so that there's enough time for questions. questions. Thank you. Yes. yes. Someone, Someone is there asking, waiting to ask, ask a question. question. I'm, I'm concerned, concerned already. already. Yes. yes. Can, a, can a black hole swallow another black hole? Can you? Say that again. Can a black hole swallow another black hole? Yes, yes of course. A black hole. What, what is a black hole? hole? You, know you know what a black hole, hole is, right? right? Yes. Okay. So, so a black, black hole doesn't discriminate. discriminate. It, it just says, says it's a place with a lot of gravity. gravity. Strong, strong gravity. gravity. And, and so, so when another black, black hole happens to come in the vicinity of it, a black, black hole doesn't care about it. It's going to pull, pull it in. And, and say they do. And we've been seeing signatures of that for the last three or four years. years. We've actually, actually, actually detected cases where black holes have swallowed each other, forming a bigger black hole. 
So you're, you're right. right. You can, can see, see it. it. Somebody, Somebody there. there. Hello. You don't raise your hand. Otherwise, yes. yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, myself, Manoj Raj from uh, Shantidama Public School. I'm from uh, grade, grade ninth. Uh, uh, my question is. Uh, uh, the, the fourth, fourth element is considered as plasma. plasma. So, so can, can you, you tell me how plasma is usually, uh, sorry, how, how it is formed in the stars? Okay. okay. Plasma. Yeah. plasma. Fair. Fair. Uh, so, so plasma is a state, state where neutral atoms are loses neutrality. neutrality. So, so the, the normal case where you have an atom with a nucleus and uh, electrons, electrons around it, you, you have, have to find a way to ionize it, to really remove some of the electrons. electrons. It could be single, single electron removed, multiple, multiple electrons removed. And, and you want to maintain it in that fashion. fashion. So, so typically, to separate this issue, you need, need to have high temperatures and to maintain, maintain it. it. So you create high situations situation where you have very high temperatures, temperatures like it happens in the, in the, in the center of a, of a, of a star, star, you can, can actually create plasma. And you have to prevent recombination of that stuff, which then means the temperatures are so high that they cannot you know, you know they, 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 they will not come back. back. The recombination rate is very small, and, and so plasma remains as it is, is, as it is until the temperature decreases. decreases. So, so in the presence of high temperature, temperature and, and, and sometimes also helped by the presence of the magnetic field, field, can actually sustain plasma. plasma. And that's the environment we have, say, say on, on the sun. sun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. I, don't I don't know who has a microphone. I have a doubt, and I must say, sir, my name is Karthik. All right. My doubt is uh, when the star dies, mm -hmm. uh, can it also become a uh, black hole? It can, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, so not all stars will become black holes. It has to be a big star, massive star, ten, ten times the you know, you know our sun has a certain mass. Say so it's ten times bigger, something, something of that size. When they, they collapse, they form a black hole. If it is less than that, they form something else. Okay. Yes. Sir, I'm in third grade. Mm -hmm. I have a doubt. Mm -hmm. What is a black hole? Uh -huh. what, what is, is a black hole? hole? Okay. Okay. What, what is black? Black, black means no, no light, light comes from it. Right? Something, Something is, is, if it's really, really black, black, you won't see anything from it. So, so a black, black hole is, is an object where it, it, it doesn't, doesn't allow any light, light to escape from it. Because it's very, very strong gravity. Gravity can pull light towards it. So it is so strong a gravity that even, even light, light cannot escape. escape. So, so you cannot, cannot see it. So, so a black, black hole is something that you can't really see directly. But, but you'll see it because if you're standing next to a black hole, hole it will pull, pull you around. And, and so, so we can watch and say, ah, he's being, being pulled, pulled. So there must be a black hole there. there. So, so that's, that's how we detect black holes. Okay? Yes. It's at the James Webb Telescope was going to take pictures from the past about how planets started. If, if that's, that's true, how does that work? How does that work? How do you see the past? Yeah. Or, ast or astrologers see it. No. no. So, so, as, as I, I mentioned, the, the Big, Big Bang, Bang model says it's an expanding universe. And the expanding universe, when, when you look, look when, when you, so, so when you see, a, when, when, when you see a distant object, which, which is also traveling at very high velocities, the light, light from that takes a long time to get to us. So the further you look, you're, you're seeing older, older light, light, light that started from very early, early days. So, so that, that is how you see the past. past. So when, when, when James, James Webb Telescope has a sensitivity to see far, far further out, what, what it's actually, actually doing is an ability to see photons that left, left long, long time back. back. And, and so, so you're, you're able, able to reconstruct the story of the first stars, the first, first planets, planets, and so on. And that, that is why you need build bigger and bigger telescopes, because you need large collecting area to see something that's much further away. Okay. And also about plasma again, how, how do comets gain enough mass and energy to have to come and enter into our atmosphere? And also, how do they not get burnt up inside our mesosphere? What was the first thing? How, how do, what, what was the... It was about comets. 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 Ah, yeah. okay. I, missed I missed the word, comets. Okay. How, how do comets... Uh, enter our atmosphere? atmosphere. Like, how do they gain okay. enough okay. energy? So, so comets, are, we believe, believe are not things that have ball, ball of gas and dust and water and ice maybe. That, that are a remnant, remnant of the solar system formation. formation. And there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a cloud out there of such comets 
way, way beyond, beyond the solar, solar system, system, the Oort cloud. cloud. Now, now from, from that, that, these clouds are still gravitationally bound, bound by the sun. Occasionally, occasionally some of them get perturbed, pushed around, around a little bit. See, Jupiter's, Jupiter's movement can move us. Like, like that, they can move some of these comets. comets. And and they, they enter the solar system, system and, and they come into a place where the sun evaporates and, and you see the tail. And so that's how you, you see a comet as it's coming close to the sun. And, and so, so that's, that's how we see the sun, the comet. And they exist as gravitationally bound systems. Now, now you also ask about how it enters the atmosphere. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't enter the atmosphere. It enters the atmosphere, of course, it will be a serious matter. matter. Yeah, our Earth's, Earth's atmosphere will be, you know, because, because it's a fairly large, large mass. mass. It's, it's like an asteroid hitting Earth. Earth. It'll, it'll have issues regarding what the debris will generate, etc. So, but we haven't had a comet hit in any recent times. But, but there could be one in the future. Yes. And yes. also about strange quarks. I, heard that well, I have no idea about strange quarks as strange to me as this to you. We won't, we won't talk about that. that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Yeah. Namaste, sir. My name is Nirajan Tulasudaman. Uh -huh. I am studying in 5th standard. All right. KV IAC. My question is, what will happen if north and south reverses? North and South, South reverses, reverses. Earth's, Earth's magnetic, magnetic field. field. Yes, sir. Oh, it's, it's a, a very serious, serious issue. You'll we'll have, have a lot of problems. problems. You will lose your direction. You'll never make it home because your GPS, GPS thing won't work. work. Satellites, Satellites will have trouble. trouble. All, All sorts of issues. So it, it doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. overnight. It is a slow movement. movement. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we are not around to see it. So you will have, you know, humans on Earth have to learn to live with the slow change of the field. Feel it weaken. And feel weakened, you know, birds might lose its way. You know, you know, but, but then, then there'll be a new generation of birds who learn to live with it, etc. So it happens over slow periods of time. We have evidence that such things have happened, but it's a, it's a long time. time. You know, we, we have been here for a very tiny, tiny interval, right? right? It's, it's only 10,000 years since we stopped wandering around and become, you know, you know people, people who actually, actually settle, settle down and live, live in society. So, so it won't happen in the near term, but it will certainly happen. Okay, sir. Hello. Yes. I am myself Good evening, sir. My, dad, my doubt was how do satellite work, satellite works, and how it is made from. Oh, oh. But there are people who would tell you all this stuff. You know, tomorrow then somebody will tell you exactly how the satellite works. Okay, but satellite works like any other planet. Planets go around, right? This is an artificial satellite. So we put it in as long as it has a way to really balance its attractive force against forces. You know, under which, which it gets pulled in and it's balanced, balanced, you will actually have a satellite, have a satellite in orbit. In orbit. Okay. That you can. Hi, sir. Yeah. Yes. yes. Who is it? Sir, here. I can't, I can't see. see. Where? Sir. Okay, yeah. Sir, sir my name is Om Patil, studying in right. standard. Mm -hmm. My question is is it economically va uh, valuable for, uh, for humans to live on other planets? Economically viable, I see. I mean, you, you think, think it's too expensive, expensive to go there? there. No, no, it's, it's correct. correct. It's, it's not, not easy. easy. That's, That's why we're not going there. there. That's why you're not able to go there. Right now, it's very expensive. expensive. But, but you, know, you, know, you know, many years ago, people thought, oh, flying, you know, if I had to visit America, America how is it possible? You can't, can't fly. It's very expensive because you know, airplanes were, you can't, can't think about jet aircraft, etc. So, in a similar way, we will find humans are very ingenious. They'll find techniques to make the cost down. Today, you know, you heard of SpaceX. These guys are flying people at incredible rates, cheap rates, very soon. So it will be viable very soon. Don't worry. Uh, yes. Just two more questions. Yeah. yeah. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Hello, sir. Myself, Gautam. I am from uh, Sheshadipuram, Maine. Second, I am studying in second U. Okay. okay. My question is a basic one. Mm -hmm. So as, as we study, I get worried when you say basic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as as we study, they, teachers say learn, learn from the basic. Basic is more important than absolutely, anything. Absolutely yes, correct. So, so my question is, what, what happens? The basic of the 90% of our science, science called as Big Bang, bang if it not, not true, true. Mm -hmm. our 90% or 80% of our uh, chemistry, chemistry, biology, physics, everything, everything get inverted. inverted. So yeah. what, what happens if, if scientists today or tomorrow or, tomorrow or somewhere, somewhere else, else, some, after, after some years, years discovers that it is not Big Bang? What, what will happen to our uh, science? Very well, valid. As, as long as you don't have an exam tomorrow, tomorrow and you're not planning to study, study because no. <laughs> theory will be wrong. No. No, no, but, but this, this is the this is the thing that makes modern, modern approach to science different. different. The, the modern, modern approach, approach to science allows corrections to all our theories. theories. We, we accept the fact that what we see is only one version 
and that today's, today's best version of a model. We, we use observational data, data, what we see in the sky, what we, what we do in the lab, to, to fit theories, theories that will explain that. that. So, so while, while there may be corrections to Big Bang, etc., what, what you observe in the universe and largely will still largely be true. There'll be corrections to that, but, but it won't be a dramatic change. change. But even, even if it is, we will accept it. I mean, I mean quantum, quantum mechanics would have looked foolish 100 years ago, right? Today, today that's application. application. I mean, you, you, will, you know, 10, 10 years from now, you'll have quantum computers, computers in your pocket. pocket. Yeah. Come on, next, sir. Next, next. next. Somebody, somebody else. else. Hello? I, I know, I know. I, but I can't tell. Somebody has to decide who should tell. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Where, where? where? Ah, ah, yes. yes. Uh, uh, I am Adit from uh, class 5. Okay, yeah. So, uh, like, if we live in some uh, ISS, International Space mm -hmm. Station, what all, like, problems uh, do we need to face for, like, uh, the gravity and all? Yeah, 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 a lot of things. I mean, again, somebody would have talked about this, I think, because there was, uh, yesterday there was a talk on how to become an astronaut, etc. On, on ISS, the biggest problem you will face is uh, getting a space suit of your size. Number two, you, you know, know, you, you will not, not up and down, down will all be gone, gone and you will be bloated up a little bit because gra pressure is not, right? right? You're in low gravity conditions, you don't, you don't have, have your legs, legs muscles, muscles are not exercised, etc. So, so you don't have to worry about, about you know, you don't, first, first two hours you might think is all fun. After, after that, you'll start feeling bloated. Actually. So there are things you have to get used to it. Small space, you can't go out into and, and play, you can't do things like that. But a bigger concern would be you're constantly uh, worried about what might happen like, like radiation, radiation etc. You know, sun, sun might have some event, you need to worry about, about it. Why, Why do you think they're not going to Mars as of now? Because going, going to Mars, we can't predict when the sun will explode. explode. And it, it takes six months to get to Mars. In between, some, some of these things happen, happen. we're not sure whether they'll be able to survive. So, so there are a large number of issues to worry, but uh, otherwise it's a fun thing. You can always look down and go around the Earth every two hours. Okay. Yes. If somebody has to doubt. Yes. yes, okay. okay. Tell, Tell me. me. Is, is it true that, that moon okay. has one, water? One second, let me just uh, hear from her. Yes. My, My name is Nadevangan and I am from KVDRU. Okay. I doubt it does it have water. If, if yes, yes, then why is there no? If, if there is water on moon? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Well, water is there on moon. I mean, that is why is there no life? Why is there no life? Water doesn't mean there's life. That's why I said the probability did not say if there's water, there's life. Okay, okay, water, water so even life on Earth, we're not very sure how it originated, right? They, they could have water, but life may have come from outside. So that's a question we remain open-minded on. Now, the moon has, it's, a, it's not a very big body, so it didn't preserve its atmosphere. It lost its atmosphere. The atmosphere and the magnetic field that Earth has protects us from a lot of the solar radiation, solar particles, micrometeorites, etc. So it is possible that life could not have originated given, given the, the very harsh, harsh conditions of the moon. So, so Earth, Earth has certain benefits. benefits. These, These are questions that are important, but we sort of think that's the reason why, why while there is water. And, and that, that is not, you don't, you don't have, have enough water to go there and drink right, right now. Unless, unless you go to the poles, poles maybe. But, but there is the presence of water. Okay. Okay. And they may have lost all its water because it didn't have enough gravity and it volatilized and escaped into the solar system. Yeah, so we are now closing the question and answer sessions. Uh, Hello. Hi, how about you? Uh, we're closing, closing the question and answer session. And anyway, they, they have to uh, organize it. Okay. okay. Just, just, just one, one last one. one. One last one. You asked it already, right? You, you asked one question before, no? Okay, okay. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Both, both of you can ask. Sir, ah. sir, what do you mean by worms? Sir, I have a doubt. Oh, very difficult question. I told you, black hole, I already explained. It is something where light cannot escape. So if light, light cannot escape, escape. If, I, if I leave, you know, turn on a torch, it will not be able to go out because the light will be pulled back by the black hole itself. And it, hap it forms when a big star collapses. You know, it actually dies in the depth. And when the star dies, they can form a black hole. Okay? Your, your one last question. Yeah. No, 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 I told you. That's it. Really yeah. have to uh, close the session. I request everybody to please be seated. Okay, after this we can talk. Okay. Please be seated. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, please, please be seated, everyone. Please be seated. The, the question and answer session is now closed. Please be seated.
uh, thank you, sir, for your session today. It was very insightful. Uh, I now request uh, Sri Xavier Raja, sir, uh, chairman of the organizing committee and controller at HSFC, to give a memento to our speaker as a token of our gratitude. The, the event is now over. over. Catch us in the remaining days of Human Spaceflight Expo 2022 organized by HSFC ISRO. Witness exciting events, live lectures and demonstrations celebrating ISRO's advancements towards human space exploration. Thank you everyone.